Right, so ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, six o'clock, so we can get started. I think there's still some people coming, but that's a, uh, they can always filter in the back somewhere. I'm Mike Brown with uh, ETFSA. I'm going to be talking first tonight, uh, so Narina gets the last word, which she likes. Uh, she'll talk after me. Um, I'm going to do the boring bit to really talk about what are ETFs and how they work and stuff like that. Narina will talk to you about how to make money running portfolios and ETFs. And uh, So if you survive my bit of the presentation, which is quite short, you'll enjoy her lot, which, which comes later. We're going to try and do this quite quickly because we've got a big crowd here and we don't want to keep you here too long, but we'll have a question answer session afterwards where you can ask questions. And uh, if it's a question that you don't think is of general interest, then we can always chat afterwards. This whole thing's on a webinar, so we're all on TV, so you're all very smartly dressed, except for this bloke here who came in his gardening shorts, uh, but, uh, but the camera probably won't pick you up because it's right at the back. But thanks to all the rest of you, there's some very smart girls here, like these two ladies in black and uh, the bloke in the uh, flower jacket at the back there. We'll have to get you into the photographs as well. Uh, for the, uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so we'll be recording this as well. So uh, if there's any stuff you miss, it'll be on our website and you can pick it up. And if there's stock fills and investors down in, you know, down the bush somewhere, they can also uh, pick up on this, on this, uh, on what we've got to say tonight. So, right, let's get going. Um, Let's just remember which, which uh, thing to push. That one. There we go. There's the agenda. What are ETFs? How do they work? ETFs, Exchange Traded Funds, which is a generic term for the products that are on the JSE that in this particular category includes ETNs, Exchange Traded Notes, benefits of ETFs, how you would use them in a, in a portfolio, discretionary portfolio, which is money you run yourself. You can move funds in and out of a discretionary portfolio. So we're not talking retirement funds or living annuities, which was the seminar we had last month, uh, running your own portfolios, how specifically to use them in stock fill, investor clubs and so on, which is very popular nowadays. And I know a lot of people you here are from uh, stock fills, investor clubs. And then we'll finish off talking about tax-free accounts, which I think is a great, great product. So I've got a bit to talk about, so I'll get through that fairly quickly. So what are ETFs? It's just a portfolio of shares listed on the stock exchange. What's a portfolio of shares? Well, it's a whole bundle or a whole basket of shares. And when you buy a company on the JSC, you're normally buying one company. You're buying shares in Absa, you're buying shares in South African breweries. It's a nice company. Makes beer or Woolworths, which you know sells, I don't know what they do, Woolworths. Um, but that sort of thing. You're normally buying a company and you're just buying interest in one particular company. When you're buying an ETF, you're buying a whole portfolio of shares. So you buy one ETF and you get a whole fund or portfolio of shares. That's why they call ETFs, exchange traded funds. So just keep that in mind. So effectively, an ETF is like a unit trust. Unit trust is where you also buy a portfolio of shares, but a unit trust is actively managed. The unit trust manager says, well, I will try and outperform the market by buying and selling shares and showing I'm smarter than the market. We'll get back to that later. But typically, they're not. Big advantage of ETFs, they are unit trusts in terms of their structure, but they're listed in the stock market. And by being listed in the stock market and by being simpler in their structure, and we'll talk about that later, they're a lot cheaper than unit trusts. You know, there's some mad people out there, including some woman who says, well, ETFs are more expensive than unit trusts because all the layers of fees and all the rest we don't talk about, she doesn't realize that ETFs don't have those layers of fees. These are modern products. They're listed in the stock market. They've been designed to do away with all the layers that are applicable to a unit trust, which is a participatory interest and has to create units all the time, every single day. It doesn't happen in ETFs, so we don't have time to go into that, but ETFs are effectively listed unit trusts, but much cheaper and much simpler than unit trusts. They trade just like any other securities in the JSC, so you can buy and sell them through the stock market, and that's a big advantage relative to things like unit trusts and other products where you can only buy and sell them through the person who issues them. So those are over-the-counter products, an ETF is traded through a stock exchange, which has big benefits in terms of security and giving you a custodianship through a central register and so on. Big thing to remember about ETFs, they track an index. And if you're tracking an index, that's what's called passive investment. Reflecting the value of an index is called passive investment. Trying to beat the index is called active investment. So ETFs are passive investments. 
uh, unit trusts are typically active investments. So that's where they differ. So now people are saying, well, what's an index? Oh, okay, so that's the, next, that's the next thing. So what is an index? An index is just a basket of shares that reflects the performance of the market. And that can be the whole market. It could be the all share index or the top 40 index. In other words, if you're buying a basket of shares that reflects the performance of the market as a whole. Let's say you buy the top 40 index, Satrix 40. Some of you know Satrix 40. Um, about 90% of all the trade in the JSC happens in the top 40 shares. So if you buy that top 40 index, you're really getting the performance of the market. <laughs> the other 10% of the market doesn't really matter. So you buy that top 40 index through an ETF, you're really getting a, a proxy for the entire market. And that's what an index is. An index records the performance of a sector of the market or the market as a whole. So we've got the market as a whole, all share index, top 40 index, or you can just buy a sector of the market. You can buy the industrial index or the resources of the financials. You all heard of Satrix Indy, Satrix Industrial Index. Or there's various ETFs that give you access just to certain sectors of the market. Or you can buy different types of assets. You can buy equities, which are shares, but you don't have to just buy South African equities. There's also ETFs that give you exposure to international shares. You can buy the DBX products. The DBX products give you access to the international stock markets, the world markets, or the USA, or the UK, or uh, Europe. You can buy a DBX product that gives you exposure to the Chinese market. China is going to be the world's biggest economy in a couple of years' time. It's going to be the world's biggest stock market one of these days. Should I be buying China? Long-term portfolio, of course you should be buying China. It's going to be the, the global engine for growth, due course. So you can buy an ETF that gives you exposure to that index or that basket of shares. You can also buy ETFs that give you exposure to bonds, government bonds, inflationing bonds, or commodities. You've heard of new gold. That just buys you the performance of the gold price, or new platinum, or, or any of that. You can buy an ETN, or that gives you exposure to the oil price. If you think oil is going to rise, you can buy an ETN. If the oil price goes up, price of your exchange traded note will, will rise. So these ETFs give you exposure to all different types of assets. And as well as that, we've still got property, currencies, cash. You can buy an ETF that just gives you a money market investment. Currencies, very interesting. You can buy the new wave ETNs. And those give you exposure to a deposit on an international bank deposit. So let's say you buy the new wave dollar. That's actually giving you access to a deposit in dollars in the London interbank market, so that dollar deposit is guaranteed by the Federal Reserve, so you can't lose any capital on that, on that dollar part, but you're buying it in rands. Every time the rand depreciates, the price of that ETN goes up. So you're buying a money market investment that's giving you 30% per annum return, and what's your savings account giving you at, at ABSA? About 5 6%. So uh, you're not picky on ABSA. Um, uh, that just happened to be, you know, let's start with an A. Um, <laughs> But so you can buy all sorts of different ETFs and ETNs that give you exposure to different types of assets. I don't have time to go into them here, but on this uh, tables outside, we've got a list of all the different ETFs. But if you go to our website on ETFSA, you can click up on every single one of the 70 ETFs, ETNs on the stock market. And it'll, get, it'll download a profile, a fact sheet. It'll tell you what's in that particular product, how it's performed. There's interactive graphs and all the rest. So all the information you need on these ETFs is available on the website. We live in a modern age. You want information, you get it off the web. <laughs> Even old blokes like me know how to do that. So, it's a, so uh, that's what we're all about, is giving people access to what I think are the most exciting investments in the market. So let's, before we get off what's an index, let's just look at an index. This is the top 40 index on the JSC. So there's the 40 shares, top 40 shares on the JSC, Alphabetically, so it starts with Anglo, Platinum, Anglo, American, and then it goes all the way down to MediClinic, and he's saying, well, that seems a bit of a crook, but then there's another page, and it goes all the way down to Woolworths. So this is the index that measures the performance of the top 40 shares on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, called the top 40 index. We don't pick that index. The Stock Exchange picks that index themselves. But you can buy with an ETF, buying a top 40 ETF, Satrix 40, for instance, you can buy that whole index. <laughs> So if you buy the Satrix 40 ETF, you own a little bit of each of those 40 shares. So that's a portfolio of shares. So you're buying a basket of shares with one single share that you buy. One single transaction buys you that entire basket of shares. Now, some companies are bigger than others. Let's take South African Breweries, which makes beer, and that's 15% of the index because that's a much bigger company than let's pick on Woolworths again, which sells ladies' underwear and stuff. 
which is only 1,3% of the, this guy's lies, oh, I was lit up when we said that, uh, it's, uh, it's Mother's Day in about May or something, I oh, remember that. So breweries is a much bigger company, 15% of the index than Woolworths, so if you reconstruct this index, and if you buy Citrix 40, 15% of your portfolio will be South African brewery shares, and 1% will be Woolworths shares. So the Citrix 40, or any index tracker, will exactly replicate that index. So it performs exactly like the index. So if you listen on Kai FM and all Stevie B gets up and he says the index went up 1% or down half a percent today, he's talking about the aggregate price of all 40 of those shares going up or down. And you can buy an ETF that gives you exposure to that performance of the market. So that's a simple way of investing. I don't have to go and do research on all those 40 companies. I just buy a product that gives me exposure to that 40 companies. And over time, the top 40 index goes up. It goes down occasionally, but most of the time it goes up. So that's a very nice investment for you to get into. So that's what an index is. It's quite simple. And you've got a whole group of these are very nice companies. Steinhoff, I mean, great company. Uh, Vodacom, you know, when the telephones work, they're not too bad. MTNs and their Sassel and so on. So you're buying a portfolio of all the top companies in the, on the stock market. You're buying South Africa Inc. You're buying the performance of the South African economy. And, that, and that's what an ETF will give you. All right, so what are the benefits of buying the index? Well, the index gives you the average return of the market. Because if you think about it, the price at which those shares trade up and down all day long, the price at which they settle is the average. So the average return of a market is what an index gives you. Just like the consumer price index is the average inflation rate in South Africa. An index gives you the average return of the market. So the guy in the nice jacket there with the flowers on is saying, who wants to be average? I want to be better than average. Okay, so let's look at the numbers. This is a study done by S&P, Standard & Poor's. These are the guys who come and give us a credit rating downgrade one of these days, but let's, let's not talk about that. Um, and they're saying, well, how many around the world managers... And now I'm measuring thousands and thousands of active portfolio managers can beat the index. So let's look at America. How many can beat the Standard & Poor's 500 index in America? And this is underperformance. 86% of all managers in America up to December 2015 couldn't outperform the index. 76% over three years. 89% over five years. And wherever you look, South Africa, same thing. 85% of all your active managers in the country. Let's not pick on Epson now. Let's pick on Alan Gray because that's also eight. Those, those guys who are so smart can't beat the index. But you can buy the index with an ETF. So it's like supporting Mamelodi Sundowns rather than Joe McCosmuth. You like to put support a side that wins. You buy an index, you're going to be winning. <laughs> Very few people can outperform the index over time and consistently. The guy outperforms this year doesn't outperform next year. So buying an index makes a lot of sense because it does give you the average return of the market. If markets are efficient, it's very hard to outperform an efficient market because all the, all the knowledge in the market is in the price of a share. So efficient markets, and South Africa's market is quite efficient for the top companies because everybody knows what's going on in those top companies. So that's why an index has a, a big benefit. The other big benefit, and there's lots of them, but we'll just go to one more, is if you buy one ETF, so you're just buying Citrix 40. I'm just going to pick on one. But you now own a whole portfolio of shares. So you're buying one ETF, but you now own a whole box of 40 chocolates. But you've only paid for one. <laughs> so what you're doing is you're getting a bargain. Because if you had to go and buy those 40 shares separately, you'd have to pay JSC stock brokerage charges and settlement charges and insider trading levies and all the rest 40 times. You buy an ETF, you only paid once. So it's a very cost-effective way of getting access to the market. And that makes a hell of a big difference over time. Investment costs are a big determinant of performance. And that's why, when we go back to that previous slide, of course, I'll take six hours to get there. That's why all these smart kids, you know, all these hedge funds and all these clever guys, you know, go around in Ferraris and wear shoes without socks and all that sort of stuff. That's why these guys can't outperform the index because their costs are too high. <laughs> their costs are much too high. <laughs> but you can buy the index cheaply. And so, you can, uh, so you can run your own portfolio using ETFs. All right, so, uh, so I'm repeating myself here. Buy one ETF and get an entire portfolio, price of a single trade. So let's look at some very quick strategies because this is what Noreen is going to talk about. She's going to talk about how you put together portfolios in ETFs. Um, those people right at the back, are there no chairs anywhere here? Uh, yeah, there's one or two seats right up front if you want to come through. They can hear me. <laughs> um, 
we might have to get a bit closer, but you two, you two are related, aren't you? I mean, you're married or something, so you don't know mind being closer, right? Um, there's, there's seats up here, and one or two here, and up the front there. Otherwise, we can bring some extra seats in. But thanks for coming. Welcome. <clears throat> well, let's just look at an example. If you want to, and you can do this through the ETF as an investor plan. Let's say you're going to put a thousand rand a month into one ETF. Let's pick the Satrix ND now. We were talking about the Satrix 40. Let's pick something else. Let's pick the industrial index. And I put a thousand rand a month debit order, and you can put 300 rand a month in. It depends how much you can afford. But a thousand rand a month, they tell me, is a cup of coffee a day for 30 days, and that's so uh, you just don't drink so much coffee or don't drink so much beer, and you just save the money and you buy, put a thousand rand a month into the Satrix Indy. What would your performance be? And this is actual numbers going back over the last 10 years. After a year, it's only worth 12,000 rand, but a thousand rand a month after five years, 100,000 rand after 10 years. 350,000 rand up to 20 years, that investment is 3,7 million rand. <laughs> That's the benefit of compound interest. You're just buying a good investment, low cost, and you're just keeping the money going in there. Being rich is just being getting in the habit of saving. Being rich is a, it's a habit. There's good habits and bad habits. Putting money away into investment is a good habit. And all the girls here are much young, pretty young, so they can start doing that now. And in 20 years, I'll be worth a lot of money. I'm not so sure about some of the blokes. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Even this guy in shorts, I mean, he's probably uh, he's, you're more than 30. So, but you can still invest for another 30 years. Okay. Yeah. So that's one way of doing it. The other way is you can set up a portfolio of ETFs and say, well, I will decide how much I want to have in the South African equity market. Yeah, we've got 30%. I want to put 40% into foreign equities. There's ETFs that will do that for you, the DBX Tracker USA. FTSE 100 is the UK market. Japan is the Japanese market. Euro stocks is the European market. That's four different currencies you're investing in, dollars, pounds, yen, and euros. So you've got a currency edge because the rand goes and falls at different levels against those four different. So you're buying a currency edge. You're buying four ETFs through four different currencies. You can put money into bonds, into listed property, and these are the ETFs you can choose. We've just given you a selection. That portfolio would give you 20% per annum over the last five years return. Doesn't sound so high. Well, let's look at what the average return of the unit trust has been over that period. The same sort of portfolios, low equity, 9,7, medium equity, 10,6, high equity, 11,6. This portfolio you can pick yourself has given you 20% return. Investing isn't always about being smart. It's just about getting in the right products and staying there. It's about being sensible with your money. So I'll leave it at that because Narina, I don't want to steal Narina's thunder and she's much better at this stuff than I am. And uh, she also looks better on the webcast, I'm sure. So, let's, let's, But I'm not going to stop just yet. We're going to talk about Stockfell's Investor Clubs. And then we're going to talk a little bit about tax-free savings. And we're more or less on time for once. So a legal status of a Stockfell Investor Club Burial Society, they all have the same legal status effectively. And all that status is that the Government Gazette in 2013 said that these things, Stockfell's Investor Clubs Burial Societies, are exempt from having to register as financial product providers. So Stockfell actually collects money from a group of people. Now, if you were going to do that as a normal business, you'd have to get a banking license. You can't take deposits from people. But if you're a Stockfell, you're allowed to take, collect money from a group of people. So they gave you exemption in terms of the act to operate as a club. Stockfell, Stockfell is effectively, you know, an investor club, a social investor club. Burial society is a is a communal thing where everybody clubs in money. When somebody dies, uh, you pay for the funeral and you have a hell of a good party and so on. But you know, you've got to die to get your money out. But uh, that effectively, it's a these are what's called friendly societies. Now, how do they define a stockfell investor club? And we can give you more detail on this. Um, but effectively, it's just a group of people. So it can't be a company. It's got to be a group of natural people. So it's a bunch of oaks. Or girls, okay, the girls are much better at investing than guys, so it's probably a bunch of girls, consist of a group of natural people, a common bond exists together to form a group savings scheme or a rotating credit scheme, and it consists of members who pledge their support to each other by setting specific objectives. Big objectives, we're going to invest our money, or we're going to put all our money in a pool and we're going to go and spend it at the end of the month and go and buy groceries, as long as you've got a specific objective. And so a Stockfell Investor Club has to have a constitution or a founding statement saying what you're going to do. You must agree to that. All the members must agree to that founding statement. It establishes a continual pool of capital by raising funds. So you say, everybody, listen, you've got a coffee in 100 bucks a month or whatever it is. So you're consistently getting 
money into it. As long as you're creating a pool of savings, you effectively are an investor club. Provides for members to share in profits. So if you make a profit, you invest the money. End of the year, it's worth a bit more. Your members can all get a contribution proportionate to their con how much money they put in in those profits. And it's self-regulated. There's no rules. <laughs> it's a self-regulated. The government's assuming that we mature enough to be able to run a society or run a club. In some cases they're wrong, but in most cases they're right. <laughs> because you've got a group looking after you. So if you've got some skeleton there who's trying to run away with your money, everybody else is going to say, hang on, you can't do that. Because every decision is made in the group. <laughs> so that's what a stock fill investor club is. And that's all the legislation says about it. So it's something that's quite easy to set up. Group of people at work, group of people... And my daughter has these book clubs, and I say, well, why do you, you don't talk about books, you just get there and drink Chardonnay, why don't you set up a, an investor club? Oh, well, you know, <laughs> but eventually they'll get around to it. But as long as you've got a group of people with a common interest, but doing investment is a very good thing, because eventually everybody will get interested in it, and you'll be able to tell people to do different things. What you need to set up a stock fill investor club, you've got to have a constitutional founding statement. Outside, uh, we've got a copy of the, of the stuff you need to set up a club. And we'll give you, and we've got a pro forma constitution there, so you just fill in the bits you need to. But you can get these off the website. <laughs> you can download a, a constitution for an investor club off a website. You've got to have a letter or document signed appointing somebody to act on behalf of the investor club or stock fill. So not everybody in the club can give instructions on an investment. You've got to appoint somebody who's, you know, who's reasonably reliable and that you can rely on. So it's probably going to be a woman to be the authorised person for that club. <clears throat> And everybody in the club has to agree to that. So they all sign a, a document saying, we appoint this lady to run the club on our behalf. And then whoever's doing the investments for them will then take instructions from that authorized person. So an authorized person is you just pick somebody responsible, like your mother or somebody like that. Don't pick your, don't pick your dad. Um, the, uh, and you keep a copy of the investors. So all the people who are members of the club, you have to have a register, which you keep. And you've got to have a bank statement in the name of the investor club or stock fill. So you've got to go and open a bank uh, account. So you've got to go and bank account, okay. So you've got to go and open a bank account, but you've got to even, you know, I don't want to pick on ABSA, but they all do it. I think, I think only one bank's difficult to, to open a stock fill account, and I can't remember which one it is. But you go there and say, I want to open a stock fill account or investor club account, they'll do that for you. And they'll ask you for all these documents, a founding statement, an authorized person, et cetera, et cetera. As long as you've got an account on behalf of the, the uh, club, then you can set up an investment account, which means that the money can only come from that account. It can't come from anybody's own individual bank accounts, and no money can be paid out to that individual's bank account. Everything comes in and out of a stock fell account. And you then get a bank statement from your bank to, to show that. And then we only need the FICA documents, the identification documents for the authorized person. Whoever you point as a representative, we need these identification documents, where she lives, what it what her uh, bank, uh, what her uh, ID, copy of ID, registration, proof of address, et cetera, et cetera. So it's quite easy to set up a stock for investor club. People come to me and say, we've got to set up a company or a trust or something like that. You don't have to do that because then you've got to appoint a lawyer. That guy's going to take all the money you make in that investor club he's going to take. So you don't want to do that. It's quite simple to do that. But all the documentation he needs on our website or you can get this documentation outside. So you should all be looking at doing this. Using exchange traded funds in an investor club is quite a good idea because you can use ETFs, as I've told you, to give you access to all different types of asset classes. You can say, we don't have all our money in equities, we want to have some money in bonds or some money in cash. You can get ETFs that give you exposure to those asset classes. So it's quite simple to do that. Very low costs. I'll talk about costs just now, but you don't want an expensive investment. Low investment minimums. ETF is our investor plan. We'll talk about that also just now. You don't have to put more than 300 Rand a month in or 1,000 Rand as lump sum. So you don't have to be a, a big, rich club. There are some big, rich clubs here, and some of them are here. Some of them are quite small, and now they're hundreds of thousands of Rands. But, you know, you can start with a small investor club stock fill. And quarterly dividends that get paid by all the ETFs, so you can use those dividends either to distribute them to your members or use the dividends to offset costs in the club. So if you decide you can't take decisions without a bear, then you can go and buy a case of beer with the dividends or a case of Chardonnay, whatever it is. But uh, So you can decide how you manage that. All right, so 
The ETFSA investor plan, which you can you can do through ETFSA, it's on our website. We'll accept investments from a thousand rand or three hundred rand a month, either from individuals, each of you as an individual, or as a club. So we regard a club as an individual entity in its own right. Or it can be a company or it can be a trust or whatever, but we take investments from quite a low amount. It's not a case where you've got to have a couple hundred thousand rand or millions of rand to invest. Dividends will be automatically reinvested four times a year if that's what you want. We charge you a brokerage fee of 0.08% per transaction. So you invest a thousand rand, that's going to cost you eight cents. It's not brokerage up front. We charge you an annual fee of between 0.4% and 0.7%. So in a thousand rand, that costs you seven rand a year. Not seven rand up front, not seven rand a month, seven rand over 12 months. So that's why we need lots of business flow in order to, to make money. Um, but this is not expensive. ETFs are quite cheap. Third-party investments we will facilitate, so you can invest on behalf of your kids, your grandchildren, or whatever have you. Ideal for investor club stock fills. We have a lot of investor clubs and stock fills now on our, on our books. And we only specialize in ETPs, and that's the website. So if you're saying, I'm a, I've got a stock fill, and we just give our money to, let's not pick on APSA, let's pick on somebody else, Nedbank. You don't have to give that money to Nedbank. You can go and open an investment account with ETFs and put into ETFs. Or go and put in unit trusts if you can't think of anything better to do. But ETFs are better than unit trusts. But you should be investing some of your money, both as an individual and as a, as a stock fill. All right, so there's tax-free investment accounts. Uh, these are becoming very popular. And all that happens in a tax-free account is that any income you earn in that tax-free account, whether it's interest, dividends, or any capital gains, is tax-free. So normally when you earn interest on a, on a savings account, you pay tax on that interest. If you receive dividends as a withholding tax, the government pinches 15% of your dividends before it even pays them out to you. But if you're in a tax-free savings account, you get 100% of the dividends. You don't get any withholding taxes. You don't get any tax on interest. Any capital gains, you invest 1,000 Rand and in a couple of years' time it's 2,000 Rand, you don't get taxed on the capital gain. The tax-free accounts are very nice as a way of getting into savings. They all pay four dividends a year, which is nice. So you're getting lots of interest and lots of income, which is tax-free. Uh, tax-free capital gains are key. Let's just look at that. If you take a situation, now a lot of you have got, because the banks have been very successful in this. Banks need to raise deposits in order to, 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 to lend money. So what they've been doing, they're wrapping a lot of their deposits up in tax-free accounts. But if you buy a, a savings account at the bank, the average return has been 5.8% per annum for the last five years. So your 30,000 Rand, if you'd invested that, 30,000 Rand is the minimum, is the maximum you can put in a tax-free account. That's 30,000 Rand after five years would be worth just under 40,000 Rand. So that's about 10,000 Rand appreciation, but that's not fantastic. If you put it into the all share index, you'd have got 12,7% per annum, so double the return. So your 30,000 Rand would be worth about 55,000 Rand, but if you bought the ETFSA, We've got an equity portfolio where we give you six different ETFs. This year we're giving you four different ETFs, but in a portfolio, that would be worth 80,000 Rand tax-free. So if you're putting 30,000 Rand away each and every year and it's 80,000 Rand after five years, that starts mounting. That's quite a lot of money. And there's no tax implications. When I withdraw that money, I don't get taxed. So if I open a tax-free account for my kids, and, I mean, you're all pretty young. I mean, you know, including you. I mean, you know, the old guy you got next to you, uh, the short side. Um, but the kids, 10 years' time, they get to university and they want to pay university fees. They can draw that capital with no tax. You're not buying an insurance policy. You don't have to die to draw on your education policy. <laughs> you're actually getting a very good return because the government wants to encourage savings. So it's giving you this incentive to encourage savings. All right, so just tax-free strategies, limited to 30,000 Rand per year. Um, you can do it for any individual, as long as they've got an SAID number. So you can do it for all your kids, your grandmother, your mistress, whoever it is. You can open up a tax-free account for them, as long as they've got a self having ID number. So it doesn't matter if they're a minor. Okay? The, you can't do it for your Australian pal, because he doesn't have an SAID number. So it's got to be South African investments. One thing is a tip. Try and do your investment as early as possible in each tax year. You're allowed to do 30,000 Rand per tax year. The tax year starts from 1st of March. If you invest your 30,000 Rand or whatever you can afford in March, you then pick up four dividends. Because dividends are paid at the end of March, end of June. So you're getting four dividends tax-free. So the sooner you get your money in, the more possibilities you've got of tax-free growth over the full year. So don't wait until the last day to do your tax-free account, which is what everybody did this year. All of a sudden, we were swapped. 
with tax-free forms falling off the table, there were so many, because everybody waited until the last day of the year. Do it early. If you don't have a 30,000 rand, you can invest a 1,000 rand as a lump sum, or 1,000 rand a month as a debit order, as I said. And we've given you three different portfolios to choose from. For this year, you can get a balanced income equity portfolio. It's a 50% in bonds and or interest-bearing assets, 50% in equities. Or you can put 100% in an equity-only portfolio. Or we can give you a foreign ETFs only. So if you're saying, listen, I think the rand's going to fall, we'll put all that 30,000 rand into a foreign ETF portfolio, DBX products. Or if you give us a full 30,000 rand investment, we'll allow you to choose any one single ETF that's available. And there's about nearly 40 of them but you've then got to put the whole amount into that one ETF. So we, we give you a lot of different options as what to do. And so it's a very nice investment, I think, to look at. But Narina will talk to you a little bit more about that. I think that's me now, is it? Yeah, there we go. So I'm, I'm done. At the end of this, we'll take some questions, and then you'll get me up again. But uh, in the meantime, let's turn over to Narina Fisser, who is my fellow director at, uh, at ETFSA. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Goodbye. Great stuff. Wow, what a packed room. Um, it's, it's wonderful to see all of you here. Thank you for joining us tonight, but thank you in particular for doing this for yourself because this is really, um, I think, there's so much that we feel helpless about or that we feel like victims. We can't help ourselves. And this is something that you can not just do yourself, but help yourself in that way as well. And I really want to talk to you tonight about the power of sharing. You know, they say sharing is caring. Um, and we are here tonight, most of you representatives, either of an existing investment club, Stockfile Burial Society, or maybe intending to do so. And I think the guidance that Mike has given you in in terms of, the, um, of how to set up such an investor club is great. So let me talk to you about why we are doing what we are doing. Why do we want to invest? Why do we want to do this in a shared basis? And I want to really just quote the very well-known African proverb that says that if you want to go fast, you can go alone. But if you want to go far, you best go together. And that, I think, is the power for me that lies in sharing knowledge, sharing resources, sharing capabilities, putting it all together and say, right, we can actually make a better future for each and every one of us, not just for a select few. So how did we originally start out with trying to save our money, grow our money, keep our money safe? And I think for most of us, once we move beyond sort of the cash under the mattress or maybe in the coffee jar in the kitchen, um, the next step was to say, right, maybe I should put my money into the bank. So what we often find is that people come to us and they say, I want to invest in this EFT, um, please note, not an ETF, an EFT. What, what is the rate that I will get for this? Now, when we talk about savings in the bank, there's an interest rate associated with that savings, and that's typically the frame of reference that people come from. They are used to an investment or a savings, something that you put in the bank, and you get some sort of return back for it, an interest rate. So let's say I put my 100 Rand into the bank, and it's currently yielding 5% interest per annum, for example. What does that mean? Well, all it really means is that it, after one year, you will have 105 Rand. So your 100 Rand that you put in, plus the 5% interest that you earned, and your money is 105 Rand worth at the end of one year. Nothing more, nothing less. That's it. And where is inflation at the moment? Every time that you go to the shops to buy more food, every time you fill up your vehicle with petrol, what does inflation mean? Inflation says, how are things getting more and more expensive? So this is where we have the major dilemma. Inflation currently sits at over 6%. So it means that that 105 rand that you get after one year can now buy you less than you were able to buy at the beginning of the year with 100 rand. Please note, I didn't say your money is now worthless. I just said it is worth less. But the longer we keep doing this, the more time that goes by, the less our money becomes worth and the less we are able to keep up with inflation and actually maintain the purchase power of our money. And that's the dilemma that we have if we only save money in a bank. 
So just to put the, some of the example numbers that I've put there into context for you, I'm showing you this little graph, which really the interpretation of this is this little gray bar that you see there. It's over the last 50 years, it gives you an indication of what inflation was. And you'll see in a, in a bit why it's so low on this level. This is really the percentage return that one can achieve in a year. And you'll see that there have been times where interest rates and therefore savings in the bank gave as much as 20%. But unfortunately, also inflation was very much at the same sort of level at that time. So the problem is that over time, there's a lot of periods in, in the past where your inflation rate is higher than the interest rate that you can get in the bank. So as much as we think that by putting money into a savings account in the bank and we think it is safe, Actually, it is what I refer to as a guaranteed, almost a, um, a it's a, it's a, um, it, no, I can't even remember my own quote. Um, we think of cash as a risk-free investment. Actually, you are guaranteed to get poorer if your money is just in the bank. Because the interest rate that you can return, receive from the bank can never be more on a sustainable period over time than the inflation rate that you've got. So as much as we think cash or savings money, putting money into the bank is a safe investment, it's actually a guaranteed dangerous investment because you will get poorer over time. So what is the alternative? The alternative is then that we say, well, now there's a different way that we can do things. We don't have to only save money in the bank. We can also invest it in the stock market. And Mike has told you quite a bit in terms of investing in ETFs, and that's really just an investment in the stock market. So let's look at a similar example. What if I took my 100 Rand and I put it into the stock exchange? I bought a top 40 ETF or an ETF with my 100 Rand. Well, on average over the last 50 years, the average return that you got from a stock market investment was about 20% per annum. So that means that after one year, on average, my 100 Rand would become 120 Rand. Now you can understand that dealing with that effective inflation now suddenly looks a lot better than it did before. But here's the caveat. Here is the danger or the, the uncertainty that comes with it. That's on average that you get 20%. In a bad year, you can get minus 20%, which means at the end of one year, your 100 Rand is now only 80 Rand. In a good year, on the other side, you can maybe get 35% and your 100 Rand becomes 135 Rand. And here lies the dilemma. If we look at our investments, especially on a relatively short-term basis, we might get scared because we don't like the feeling of seeing that my 100 Rand that I put into my investment is now only worth 80 Rand. And the worst thing we can then do is to sell it at 80 Rand and say, oh, no, 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 let me rather get out of here. And then you miss the opportunity for it to start growing again. Because we do know, on average, maybe it won't give us 20% every year, but it's certainly going to give us much better than cash in the bank and a lot better than inflation as well. Let's look at what I'm talking about over the long term. So this is a similar sort of graph. There are my gray bars again in terms of my inflation. And these are the historic annual returns that you got in the stock market. This is the all share index on the JSE over the last 50 years. So yes, we've seen numbers over 100% in one year. But we've also seen numbers as low as minus 48% in one year. It is hugely volatile. This is much worse than the worst roller coaster that you can ride at Gold Reef City. <laughs> and for a lot of people, the stomach feels even worse when they're on this roller coaster ride. So how does one deal with this volatility? There's a number of ways that one can deal with this. And I really want to share with you, sorry, just want to highlight there. In the last 12 months, by the way, some of you that are already invested will know that most investments over the last 12 months gave you negative returns. So the scenario of putting in 100 Rand and now it's worth only 90 or maybe even 85 Rand, that has been the reality over the last 12 months. And now a lot of people are panicking and saying, oh, should I sell? But you can see what happens after you've got those big declines then necessarily comes the big rises. We see it every single time. So the key here is to stay invested, not to panic when you see that your investment is now worth less than when you put it in, but understanding and knowing that that investment is going to increase in value again. I just need to give it enough time. 
So how does one deal with this sort of volatility, this uncertainty, the risk, the roller coaster that is the market? First and foremost, time really is your friend in all of this. And I'm sure that many of you have heard that adage that says, the power of time in the market. That really just means you need to stay invested in the market in order to get that benefit. So what I've done in this little graph, you see my very volatile dotted line, which is the one-year return that I see on the market. I then have a thin line that runs across there, which is if you look at your investments on a two-year basis. So now it's not just one year anymore. Now suddenly you see, well, we don't really have as many big negative dips. Our highs are not as high as they were before, but now this roller coaster is not quite so volatile, so not quite so scary. And if you leave your money in there for three years, the thick dark line that you see there, suddenly you start finding, but now we're in an environment that over a rolling three-year period, it doesn't often happen that we end up with less money that we put into the market. It has happened, but not often. And if I extend that time period even further to five years, the thin line, or 10 years, the dark line, do you now see that now it starts to resemble a relatively smooth path? And that is the power of sticking with your investments, staying with it. I want to use the analogy of when you are preparing a meal, once you've put your meat and your vegetables into a pot and you put it on the stove, you know that it's probably going to take the best part of an hour or two to cook properly. Will you go and eat it after five minutes? No, then you're going to say, this is horrible. Who, who made this terrible food? It's not the person who made the food that is terrible. It is you who decided to try and eat it after five minutes that's making the mistake. The same applies to when we bake a bread or we bake a cake. You take a lot of care mixing your batter, mixing your dough, putting it in the oven, and what then? Are you going to try and eat that bread after five minutes? No, you're not. You're going to wait. And just like if an oven typically will have a glass window that you can look at your bread baking or your cake baking, the stock market is very much the same. You're allowed to look at your investments and see how they grow and go up and down. But please don't open the oven door and poke your finger into the bread and say, why is this thing not cooking properly? That is what we need to do to allow the power of time to work in our favor, to get us to a position where our investment return, the dark red line, is better than inflation. Because that's really the only way that over the longer term, we are able to get wealthier and find that we have money that can buy more things for us in future. The other way to deal with volatility is all about diversification. Now, what does diversification mean? You've all heard the saying, don't put all your eggs in one basket or don't back just a single horse. And diversification is very much the same. It really talks about spreading your investments across a number of different things. Now, the first step or first level of diversification comes through your index-based products or your ETFs. As Mike showed you that index of the top 40, it's already 40 different companies in which you are investing. So you're not just taking a bet on one single company um, giving you the, the, the good return that you're looking for. You've got a portfolio of 40 different companies. Some of them doing really well, some of them may be doing not so well, but as a combination, your overall investment is similar to what I showed you there for the overall market. So diversifying through ETFs in index products is the first level of diversification. But another important way to diversify is to diversify across asset classes. Now, asset classes really just references equities or shares, buying shares in a company, bonds, which is typically a loan that one makes to the government where they pay you a certain interest rate on that bond. It could be investments in listed property where you actually get a part of the, of the yield or the dividends that are paid out from the rentals of those properties. And so I can go on. Because these different asset classes don't all quite perform exactly the same through different economic cycles, it allows for diversification in your investment portfolio. And just like when you put together a well-balanced meal, you will make sure that you have some meat, that you maybe have potatoes, that you've got some vegetables. You try and find a balanced meal when you eat. Exactly the same applies when we look at our investments. But there's other ways in which we can diversify as well. We can diversify across sectors. So not invest only in financial shares or in mining or resources shares, but also in industrial shares. We can diversify across, across geographies. 
We can invest in South Africa, but we can also invest in many different parts of the world. The US, Europe, Japan, China, other emerging markets. We can diversify across currencies. So it can be the yen, it can be the pound, it can be the US dollar or the euro. So there are many different ways in which one can reduce this huge volatility associated with the market by being well diversified across different um, investment options. So let's look at some of this in practice. Mike told you about the tax-free accounts, and what I'm going to do now is not... Uh, take you through the tax-free investment option, but I want to show you what we did in terms of putting together the tax-free investment portfolios, because I think those could be good guidelines for you in terms of putting together your own diversified investment portfolio for your investor club or for your stock fell. So let's start with a balanced portfolio. So balanced really just means I'm going to have some equities, I'm going to have some bonds, I'm going to have some property, and I'm going to have some international investments. And this is a very simple, straightforward mixture that we've got here. 25% in each of an a bond ETF, the RMB Inflation Link Bond ETF, which since last week is now known as the Ashburton Inflation ETF, just so that you know. Domestic equities, the core shares top 50 ETF, so it buys the 50 biggest companies on the JSE. The PropTrax 10 ETF, which buys the 10 largest property companies on the JSE. And then the DBX MSCI World ETF. So what does that 25% in each mean? It means that if you're going to be investing 1,000 Rand, for example, you're going to put 250 Rand in each of those four ETFs. If you do that on a debit order basis, every month you will be buying 250 Rand worth of each of those four ETFs. And over time, your diversified portfolio gets built up on that basis. You reinvest any dividends that come from it, and so your portfolio grows. And what does it grow to? Well, just to give you an idea, over the last three or five years, really, when we look at the performance of just bonds, so ordinary South African government bonds, you can see that over the last three years, because of what happened in South Africa in December, we've had very poor performance from bonds. Over the last five years, certainly better, a little bit better than cash, but not shooting the lights out in terms of performance. Equities or the, sorry, no, that's the wrong one. Equities or the all share index, yes, over the last five years, on average, about 12.3%. But here I've given you the performance of each of these four ETFs that we've chosen there over the last three and five years. And by combining these into a diversified portfolio, what you'll see is that such a low risk balanced fund portfolio over the last five years, on average, gave you a return of just over 15% per annum, well ahead of inflation. This is not a risky investment. Yes, there are times that the investment will go down in value, but if you're prepared and you shouldn't be investing unless you've got at least a three to five year investment view. So if you've got the three to five year investment view, your money will grow faster than inflation in such a low risk balanced portfolio. But what if you are a younger investor club who says, you know what, we've got lots of time ahead of us. We're not interested in this low risk bond type of thing. We want to invest only in shares, only in the stock market, only in equities. So we have a similar portfolio put together by choosing different ETFs, but they all are just equities domestic equities that we have here on the JSE. So what we've got in terms of this one is four different ETFs. Now we use some slightly different um, percentages to allocate. We've got three local ETFs. There's the well-known Satrix Indy 25, the Satrix Finney 15, and then the Core Shares Dividend Aristocrats ETF. 20% into each of them. So out of a 1,000 Rand investment, it means you would put 200 Rand into each of those three portfolios or ETFs. Similarly, we then have for the MSCI World ETF, 40% in there. So 400 Rand out of every 1,000 Rand will go into such a portfolio. This gives you diversification across sectors because these are industrial shares, these are financial shares, this one is invested in shares that pay consistently good dividends, and this one is a broad global diversified portfolio of over 1,700 global companies. So that's where you're going to find your Apple and your Google and your General Electric and your BMW and your BP and all of those ones will sit in there. 
And in terms of historical performance, when we look at the performance again of just the JSE All Share Index over the last five years, on average, 12.3%. But you can see that by selecting these selected sort of ETFs out of our domestic market, we can generate better returns. And in fact, on average, over the last three to five years, on average in the region of about 20% per annum. Yes, there have been times that markets have gone down, like the last year. But on average, over the longer term, you start seeing the much higher returns that, again, beats inflation. There might be some of you that sit here that says, you know what, I'm not comfortable with what's happening in South Africa and especially in terms of what's happening with the RAND. I want to invest my money only in international ETFs. Or in fact, people typically would say, I want to invest my money offshore and not necessarily realizing that you can actually invest your money effectively offshore in international ETFs, but still on the JSC. So the same low cost structure that you have on the rest of the JSC, you can invest in a full international portfolio on the JSC. And in this case, we are looking at four different regional global ETFs, the USA ETF, the Euro stock, so that invests in 50 companies in Europe, the UK ETF, and then the Japan one. And by splitting your money 50% to 20, 15, and 15%, it not only gives you geographic diversification around the world, but very importantly, that currency diversification also that we're looking for. So the USA one, of course, will be dollar denominated. The Euro one is Euro denominated. We've got pound sterling in the UK, and then the Japanese yen in our Japanese ETF. So in one investment portfolio investing in four different global ETFs, you're actually able to get quite a range of diversification. It's been a very good time of late for international investments, mostly because of what the RAND has done. So when we look at the performance of our investments and we see that over the last five years, we're looking at over 20, and in fact, over the last three years, 26% per annum. I just want to have a word of warning there. You know, they always say that past performance is no guarantee of future performance. It really isn't. And we really should pay attention when that, when that disclaimer is made. We've come through a period of particular RAND weakness. I think the RAND over the longer term will continue to weaken, but be careful not after the RAND has weakened by 30% to suddenly now want to take all your money and invest in international. Be aware of the fact that the global economy is also still not looking all that great and that unless you get the benefit of further RAND appreciation, the international portfolio will not necessarily give you the best risk diversified portfolio. But what I wanted to show you here really is just three sample portfolios, just three ways in which, which one can put together portfolios. But there are over 70 of these exchange traded products on the JSE. So the range is so much bigger than what I can cover here in a short half hour. On our website, there are several presentations and articles that we've done in the past where I talk about putting together a balanced portfolio. And that really brings me to my, my third point in terms of how to best deal with volatility. And that comes to the sharing component. What do I mean when I say we need to share? Well, the power of sharing for me really lies in investing together. So not only pooling your assets, but through pooling and through investing together, you are able to reduce costs for the group and you're also able to reduce the risk for the group. So that type of sharing is very powerful on a, on a, on a um, grouped basis like that. But the other thing is also, very importantly, that you should learn together. And that's why I want to direct you to our website where we've got lots of old seminars, presentations, articles to read. And I really want to encourage you to learn about this, but to make this a group effort. So one of the suggestions that I've got, and this is from examples that I've seen work really well for many other investor clubs and stock files, is to take turns in learning something new about ETFs, about investing. So when you have a monthly meeting, make it the responsibility of one of the people in the group to go and find out more about 
something, a particular ETF, a particular market, a particular currency, whatever it is that you feel is relevant in terms of your group's way of investing. Let that individual come back at the next meeting and share with all of you what he or she has learned and make that a, a joint learning experience because that's the best way that we learn is not only when we share knowledge with one another, but when you teach someone else, it's the best way for you to learn as well. And our website is a great source of lots of this sort of information. There are fact sheets. There are product profiles. There's a whole lot of information available. So I really want to encourage you to make this a learning experience as well. This is not just about going out and trying to grow your money. This is very much about growing your knowledge and your skill base as well. And finally, if you do all of that well, then you will grow wealthy together. And together we are so much stronger than each of us individually. And that's why I so love dealing with groups of people like yourself, wanting to do this journey together, learning together, investing together, and ultimately growing wealthy together. And that is my sharing for this evening. I wanted to leave enough time for Q&A because I often find that there's a lot of burning questions. So I'm going to invite Mike back onto the, onto the podium with me and to give you the opportunity to ask some questions um, and see if we can help you out. Stun silence. Well, you, We've got one taken. Thank you. <laughs> Good on, Irina. There is a mic going around. If you can talk into the mic, then we can pick it up for the webcast. That's if you want your question to be on the webcast. So, <laughs> Otherwise, so we'll repeat your question. Gonna, so. gonna start. There's a gentleman there. Uh -huh. Thank you for the good presentation. Tell me, the ETFs are the only option of buying equity. Do you have other options that are actually can access shareholding in, in, in blue chip companies? Do, do you have other avenues that one can use? investing heavily in buying shares into blue chip company to become also a shareholder later on rather than this option you know, an etf is you're buying a portfolio of shares but you're not regarded as an individual shareholder in each of those companies so that can't be done uh, if you want to do you know buy into individual companies uh you'd have to set up a uh, you can do an account with etfsa and we'll then go and invest in individual shares for you if, if you want to do that, but then it's got to be a fairly big investment to make it worth our while, but that we can do. But ETFs are a way of getting ownership of the market, but you're not regarded as an individual shareholder in each of those companies. So it's not a way of you being able to influence uh, the boards of companies in any way. So it's, it's not a tool that does that. Yes. Mike was saying, that uh, a group of people would be putting money away in a, in a bank and then the bank must take the money and throw it into the EFTs or oh, how does it work? You want to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> right, so in order to access investments on the market, the money, the cash that you want to invest has to flow via a bank account. But you choose, as the investor club, which ETFs you want to invest in. So really, the flow of the money through the bank account is just in order for the cash amount, so that it's not physical notes that you invest in, but the money to actually make it into the bank account that will pay for the ETFs that you are buying. Those are then held in the name of the stock fell or of the investor club, and based on the constitution that you have, it will dictate what is the proportional shareholding of each individual. So of the, the, the ETFs that you hold in your, in your portfolio, how much of that belongs to each of the members of the of the stock file. Not sure if I'm answering your question correctly. You are, I have another one. Uh, when is the right time to, to sell? Never. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's, I'm glad you asked that question. The question is, when is the right time to sell? Let's maybe take a, take a step back and say, what is the purpose of our investment? Why are we investing? Now, if you are investing because you have a specific goal in mind, for example, you might want to save up money for a deposit for a house. 
Or you might want to say for your child's tertiary education that's going to happen in 10 or in 15 years' time. So if your goal with your investment is that you want to achieve a certain amount of money by a certain time, then the best time to sell would be when that time comes. If the purpose of your investment is to grow up, to grow an asset base or money, wealthy investments really, that can over time generate income, in other words, dividends or distributions that you can live off, then you will never sell those investments because the distributions, the dividends that are paid out of your investments become an income for you on a monthly basis or on a quarterly basis. So deciding when to sell depends very much on why did you buy? Okay, sorry. No, sure. sorry yeah, it determines uh, wh uh, what you want to, to, to save for. Yes, yes. Suppose, like you were saying, 100 rent by that time is 85 rent. Yes. Do you sell at that time or what do you do? No, you don't. <laughs> I'll tell you why. The likelihood that it will be 85 rand after a three or five year period is extremely low. It might be 85 rand after a, a day or a month or even one year, but your investment horizon, the time for which you are invested, should never be that short if you want to invest in the stock market. If, for example, you want to save up enough money to pay for your child's school fees next year, please don't invest it in an ETF. Please put that into a savings account. I'm being very serious. You don't want to risk your investments into something that has got a very specific short-term goal with the volatility and the risk of the market. Investments are long-term effects. So differentiate between time horizon, what is my purpose, and that decides what should I be investing in. Right, thanks for your question. Thank you. Just one thing, you, one way to live in poverty is to always sell when the market falls. <laughs> you can never make money when you sell at the bottom. <laughs> 2008, 2009 was the worst period we had since 1923, 25, 26, the Great Depression. If you'd sold your Satchik's Indy at the bottom of the market then, there were 17 rands a share. Today, there's 71 rands a share. All you've got to do is sit and hold your investment. Mm -hmm. You'd sold at 17 rands a share. You now don't have the money to go and buy that Satrix India anymore because it's mm. 71 rands a share. You can't buy it anymore. You just sit and hold your investment. But don't sell every time the market falls. Because over a long period of time, like now. Yeah, like, like now. Like now. <laughs> long period of time, the market will, will grow. And good blue chip companies, what that other gentleman was talking about. Yeah. Good blue chip companies. Anglo-Americans have been around for 120 years. Not having a good time now. But it'll be fine. <laughs> They'll restructure the company and it'll be okay. <laughs> so you don't you don't sell when times are bad. It's also difficult to sell when times are high because then you're making lots of money. But you know, <laughs> but rather if you want to take money out the market, take it out when the market's running. It's high. Don't take money out when the market's low. <laughs> well, the rand's going to go weaker if we lose our credit rating, so we don't know for sure. But yes, you investing for a weak rand, as Marina's told you, is, is you can do. Right, here's, what else questions we got? This gentleman here, I think. Yeah, um, I've got two questions. First one is, uh, is it advisable to select more than a number of ETFs or portfolios at once? Or is it better to have more minimum, you know, three, four, rather than ten? And secondly, uh, uh, the... DBX Japan did very well last year, and I'm asking you how to look in your magic ball, uh, whether you can, do you think it's going to continue that performance what this year? Me, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've got to take a, you know, the DBX Japan has been a good investment now for a couple of years, and that's because uh, you know, in Japan, uh, it's quite a mature economy, but Japanese companies are very well structured. Right next door to them, what is what have they got? China. China, yeah. China has got 10 million new consumers. They're entering the market every couple of months in China. And the Japanese are sitting these guys, Sony, Fire Fires and you know, Toyotas and all that sort of stuff. So I, th I think Japan will be, a, will, will, will be a good investment. And rather than saying, listen, let's try and pick what we think is the best investment at any point in time. As Narita said, if you're going to invest offshore, 
don't just put it into one ETF. You can put it in the DBX world if you want one ETF, but pick three or four ETFs across different markets, and that will help you over time. Um, it depends on how much money you want to invest. If you want to invest a million rand, then you can pick quite a few ETFs. If you want to invest 20,000 rand, then you're probably better off just focusing on one or two. So it depends how big your investment in as to how many products you, products you pick, uh, because that then at least gives you. But you should have diversification, and you should try and pick uh, products across different asset classes. Mm -hmm. And you can do that by only picking five or six products, or you can do that by picking 20 products, but then you're repeating yourself to some extent in those sectors. So do a bit of research on it and look at what you think is reasonable. You can always drop an amino or myself a line and just say, what do you think about my selection? Do and you have another question? Yeah, the last one question. Okay. <laughs> uh, this is now based on uh, uh, property uh, uh, portfolios. Um, I'm always nervous to look at property portfolios, considering that uh, it's hasn't been doing very well, pretty much. As a person who owns the property, paying it is a headache. So um, long term, is there a possibility of a good return? In so let's differentiate between property that you as an individual might own, which is most likely a house that you own, versus an investment in the listed property sector on the JSE. The major difference between those is the listed property sector on the JSE doesn't invest in individual houses. It invests in what is called commercial property, property shopping centers, hotels, office blocks, those sort of things. Also, it doesn't only invest in property in South Africa. It invests increasingly around the world in terms of property. So listed property, unlike the retail sort of house price index or house market has actually been a very good performer. And the reason why it, it continues to be a good performer and why we expect it to continue to be a good performer on the JSE is that the yield or the income that you get from your property investment is directly linked with the rental income that the property company gets from the, the tenants that they've got in their buildings. Now, how are those rental agreements typically set up? They're typically multi-year, 10 years, 20 years even, and the rental increases are typically linked to inflation. So as inflation goes higher, so the rental income that the property company receives goes higher, and so the income that you as the investor receive from that investment also goes higher. What can be quite volatile at times is just the share price of the property companies. But if we think in terms of where does return come from, there's the component that comes from the share price, which can be quite volatile, and there's the component that comes from the income or the yield or the dividends or the distributions that you receive, which is very stable, very high, and growing. So for me, property investment is a very important part of a well-diversified portfolio. I think it is quite dangerous to put all of your investments into listed property, but certainly as part of a well-diversified portfolio, and especially a portfolio that is geared towards generating good income from your investments, that is a very important part and very different than a retail house investment. Thanks for the questions. So right yeah. Just We've about got... some grub outside, so we don't want to be too long in questions. I'm sure there's some great <laughs> questions. Who else wants um, on that lady? Myself. There's somebody here. They've... Yes. Okay. Um, so just two quick questions. The first one is, if you have investments in other companies, say you've bought directly with Satrix, is it advisable to, if we have got investments with ETFSA, to move those over? Or is it fine to leave them as is? And then the second question is, if we bought the tax-free accounts from last year um, that was split between the mm. equity and the balanced, can we now add the international to that as an option? Okay, so let me maybe start with the last question. So the very easy answer there is yes. You can change the portfolio that you've selected. There is a default change, but you also have the right to either switch the old portfolio or even just invest any new money that comes into it into the portfolio of your choice. So quite a lot of flexibility around that. In terms of your first question, um, so the question was, you know, if you've got investments in Satrix ETFs with their investor plan and you also have ETFSA, should one keep it separate or should you combine it? What is the biggest difference between Satrix and ETFSA? Satrix is an ETF provider or an issuer, so they issue a number of ETFs, many of, you, of, of which you are very well familiar with, but they only offer Satrix ETFs. And at this stage, it only covers domestic equity. 
So if one wants to buy a property ETF or an international ETF or a bond ETF, for example, you can't buy that via Satrix because they don't have any of those others. So that's why many people then have an ETFSA account as well, because ETFSA is the investment platform. Think in terms of a shop. We are the pick and pay or the spar, whereas the Satrix products is your bread or the milk that you've got sitting on the shelves. And you can go to the Satrix shop, but you can only buy bread and milk there. Or you can go to the pick and pay where you can buy the bread and the milk and the meat and the veggies and the drinks and the cigarettes and everything else. That's really the difference. <laughs> so, yes, obviously my suggestion would be move it onto one platform, onto the ETFSA platform, because also then for you to switch between different ones, you want to sell one ETF and buy another one, becomes very easy, very quick, and very inexpensive. Is well, there so a cost So if you've got involved? an ETFSA account, it's just a trading we cost. can move the Satrix across to that ETFSA account, and you don't actually sell your Satrix shares, mm. you just do a transfer. So mm. there's no transaction costs, there's no tax events <coughs> being kicked off there, so that's fine. In terms of tax-free savings, there's a form on the website called a switch form. And if you now want to switch your portfolio from last year into, the, say, the international portfolio for this year, you just say in the switch form, this is my account number and this is what I want to do. And we'll do that for you, okay? An and additional then this year you can decide yeah. what you want to do, which, which ETF you want to put into this year. But you can switch the default, I think, last year if you were in the equity portfolio, we'll put you in the new equity portfolio. But if you are in the equity portfolio last year and you want to go to the international portfolio, or to the That's balance portfolio, you just tell us and we'll do that for you. And we'll pick up the costs. And you know, I've been very, very, uh, very nice in this. Last year, we made you pay the transaction costs. And some people said we weren't the cheapest provider of ETFs in the country, which I think we are, of, of tax fee savings, which I think we are. So this year, we said we'll absorb all the transaction costs. So you only pay a 1% fee, and that, that's the only fee you pay, and we, we do all the transaction costs. Right, so I've been doing a bit of advertising there, so we need to <laughs> get somebody to, to uh, ask a you know, question that yeah. Narita can answer. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Two questions. First one, with regards to the tax-free um, accounts, to clarify, is it 30000 limit per person or per account? And then, yeah, sorry, and then sorry. second one, um, what is the wise thing to do when you say you go for the debit order option? Is it wise every year to increase it based on inflation or is it 10 percent or is it up to the individual? Okay. Thanks. So in terms of the tax free, the annual allowance is 30,000 rand per individual, per person. So you can have more than one tax free account, but your contributions to them in total may not be more than 30,000 rand. So, so that's and, and of course, also bear in mind that tax-free accounts are only available to individuals. So a stock fell or an investor club cannot open a tax-free account. So just bear that in mind. In terms of when you do a debit order investment, so let's think debit order investments for the tax-free account. It doesn't make sense to have an automatic increase every year because we don't know if there is going to be a change to the allowance in the, in the following year. So that one you really need to reassess on an annual basis based on, on, on the, um, the, the taxation changes. In terms of your discretionary or your retirement investments and so on, a lot of people like putting in an automatic increase, but I do think think it's a very prudent thing also once a year to do an assessment of your investments. And you do two things. The one is you say, what has changed in my personal circumstances? Do I need to invest differently? Can I contribute a different amount of money? It's a very, it's a good, it's almost like your annual checkup at the doctor. And at the same time, also once a year to look at your investments and say, what is working? What's not working? What is still consistent with my requirements from my investment? So, yes, by all means, put in an automatic in increase, but don't stop then from reviewing your investments and your own circumstances once a year as well. Okay. Right, thanks very much for your question. Uh, just remember, you can put your whole family into tax fee savings. You can open up for anybody in the family. The moment our record, I think, is 21 people in the family that have tax free accounts. It used to be 17, and that bloke's now. Well, he bought us two more the other day, so he's 19. There's someone who's got 21 people in their family all with tax free accounts with us. So anybody who wants to break that record, there's a challenge. Please, Come on, there's guys. a challenge. And I'll buy them lunch or something. I do that. But uh, uh, thanks very much indeed for coming. It's been great to have you all here. I know it's a bit crowded and it's a bit hot in here, so we can move outside. You can still chat to Nina and myself. If you want to come and see us, just leave your name and with Cheryl at the desk, and we hope to see you all again. But thanks so much for coming, and no doubt we'll be in touch later on. Thank you.